do you know how much I like it when you enjoy the source material more than I do? Really? <laughs> I like it so much because I feel like it's usually the reverse because I think I'm kinder generally or I'm a little bit of a softer person. We're kind of doing a good cup, bad cup on these uh, adaptations. Well, I think it may have to do with the fact that I have no cultural connection to this. So I'm coming at it completely just open-eyed, like, what, what, what are they going to do? So I'm just surprised, like, by everything. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, what are uh, okay? Who are we? What are we doing? And why are you surprised? <laughs> who are we? Those are the three questions we ask in every episode, and we have to answer by the end. <laughs> Hi, welcome to Pizza Toast. This is a podcast. It's about uh. Always an uh there, even though I know exactly what always I'm Always an uh. <laughs> it's, always, it's about books for uh, middle grade and YA, or for YA, for young adults, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, the adaptations thereof, usually the adaptations thereof. Uh, we're covering the Twilight series right now, and we've reached the point where they simply must cut a movie into two very long parts, uh, and we read the first 18 chapters of Breaking Dawn and watched Breaking Dawn part one. And my name is Christy. And my name is Phil. And it's funny how, like Lord of the Rings, it doesn't quite line up with the end of the movie. It, there's like a little a little dangly bit that they have to work into the film in order to give it a nice round. And because the, the, the chapter, well, because the first, this is the first book where she's like, we have to tell it from someone else's perspective because Bella's just in bed the whole time. <laughs> like, literally just in bed the whole time. She's either sleeping, she's banging, she's screaming. Like, those are her those are her three things she does in this, she's in this sipping. story. She's sipping that she blood. Sipping. She's learning that she loves yeah. that blood. He froze. Oh, and Christy froze. Oh, and Christy froze. Oh, and, this is and gonna Phil be... froze. Oh, this is the worst recording of all time. We're either <laughs> crashing computers, unable to hear each other, or freezing up. And it's the most important book because this is the book where Bella becomes a vampire. <laughs> this is the book where Bella becomes a vampire. This is a book where Jacob falls in love with the baby. This is a book where so many things have... He okay. doesn't. They explicitly say it's not falling in love. It's just an intense connection that's like major siblinghood. No, and I'm really glad that they do clarify that in the movie the same way they had clarified it a couple books ago. And there's a really wonderful sequence, actually. I do love this book, by the way. Like, this book, uh, unreserved affection for this one. I think it's probably the best in the series, in large part because of the Jacob perspective portion. Uh, but Jacob is spending time with, I believe, Quill and Claire, who he's imprinted on, who's uh, two or three years old. And uh, Jacob asks, like, why are you, like, did, would you ever date anyone else? And Quill's like, why would I want to do that when uh, the most important person in my life is right here? And it is somehow not creepy. And I don't know how she threads that needle, but boy, do I admire it. Uh, Breaking Dawn Part 1. What are we Breaking looking Dawn. at here? Well, this is amazing. And what's amazing is that as I read it, as I watched it, I was like, oh, everything that culturally gets made fun of about this series is such is actually dealt with such a cool hand by Stephanie Meyer or and or she lampshades it. She knows it's weird. She kn the characters know the situation they're in is weird. So mocking it and making fun of it doesn't really make sense because it is constantly acknowledged that they are in uncharted territory here, that the gross stuff is gross, the strange stuff is strange, and the characters are as baffled by most of what's going on for this chunk as we are. We're like, oh, she's pregnant by a vampire baby? That's wild. And the vampires are like, this is wild. We don't know how to deal with this. They don't like it, and they don't want it to happen, and... You and I talked about this book and how so much of the front half, the only part we've read so far, is about a number of different men trying to control Bo uh, Bella's body and make his choices on her behalf. It's actually weirdly trenchant. Yeah. Like, 
how how does it do that? Uh, Carlisle is the only one who's like her body, her choice for a long time. And that's very interesting. And like representative of the, I don't know what it's representative of, but I do like it. I am well, a considering fan. that considering that vampire lore is essentially about humanoid creatures who take control of a human's body. Like that is that's what vampires do. They either are stealing your blood or they are turning you into one of them against your will. That's that's the history of vampires in a nutshell. And for Carlisle to have taken such a strong stance as a vampire that he's like, I'm not going to hurt other people. I'm going to save other people. And I'm going to act for much of this book as this, as this girl's advocate, as this young woman's advocate at this point, so that she gets to make the decision she wants, even though Carlisle does come out against the baby. This book taking a strong pro-abortion stance for much of it, just being like, no, you should get rid of that baby. It could kill the mother. And it's the mother being like, I don't want to get rid of this baby. I know I can. I can. I can take it. <laughs> <laughs> there are uh, two people who are extremely pro-baby the entire time. You've got Bella who immediately falls in parental love with said baby, decides it's a boy, which is interesting. It's mm -hmm. like, this one's a guy, I can tell, and I'm going to name it Edward Jacob, and it's going to be the perfect fusion of the two men, in, the two most important men in my life who are not Charlie, uh, and uh, Rosalie, who is so excited about a baby happening. Um, a baby. And it's made very clear that Rosalie's not necessarily concerned about Bella. She is oh, concerned no. about a vampire baby being born because she only wants a baby. Let's step back for a second, though. We pick right up with the wedding of Bella, uh, which we've all been waiting for, which is we picture have. perfect. Uh, and did Phil Gonzalez, 47-year-old man sitting by himself watching this movie, uh, get choked up during the wedding of Bella and Jacob as she's walking down the aisle. Uh, yeah, he probably did. He probably uh, did. For me, it's not when uh, walking down the aisle. It's the very cool camera trick, like the thing that they can only do in the movie where they have their first kiss and the camera spins around and suddenly the entire crowd of people who are watching them are gone because the only two people in the world are Edward and Bella and love is so important. It's so important. I'm hitting every available service as I say this because it's so important. It's so important. We have a new director on for these movies, Bill Condon, uh, Academy Award winning screenwriter, uh, director of movies that are, we had Steve Niles, Steve, not, no, it's not Steve Niles. He wrote the comic. We had, who was the director last time? Uh, uh, oh, no one will ever remember this. Hold on. Name. Let the me guy check who my who official is Twilight Eclipse, uh, book here. <laughs> the complete guide, uh, Twilight Saga. Who was the director of this one? Uh, David Slade was the director mm, of the, David of Slade, the last that's one. Eclipse, yeah. But di yeah, director of 30 Days of Night, had a lot of vampire, but a very technical director, as we discussed. This is now Bill Condon, who is a writer. And yes. in the interviews with Melissa Rosenberg, she talks about how Condon is was like the best director to work with as a writer because he was like, we got to make these characters work. We got to make this make sense. And in seeing Condon in interviews, he's just like, I wanted to direct Eclipse. I wanted to direct New Moon. Couldn't make my schedule work. This was a dream come true. I love these characters. It's so weird when you find out that like a, a middle-aged man loves the Twilight characters. Because on the on the very surface, there's not that much to love. This is the first. Uh, this is the first piece where I love Jacob. Like I'll mm -hmm. give a, a, and I will give him that in both the movie and the book. Certainly. Um, yeah. Oh, we do open the movie instead of the wedding. We have the epilogue from Eclipse, the book, which is Jacob getting his wedding invitation and wolfing out because he's so sad. And this is a perfect way to open the movie because literally the film opens after the prerequisite Bella uh, voiceover with Jacob throwing the wedding invitation to the ground stripping himself of his shirt and turning into a wolf and you're like yeah movie <laughs> give me the stuff give me that twilight stuff i'm used to unless of course you're dealing with the director's edition or the extended yes. edition which i saw which begins with the volturi receiving the wedding invitation i and... have seen that scene and i do like that scene 
And it actually bookends the movie nicely because it ends with the Volturi as well. So Oh, see that I didn't remember. You get you begin with the Volturi receiving the receiving the wedding invite and then killing the woman who brings them the message because she <laughs> screws up. And then it ends with the baby announcement or whatever. Or or the announcement that Bella's become a vampire and them killing that messenger. And it's very fey and it's very it's very foppish and it's very um, ooh the whole thing and it's perfectly done. I have and seen gruesome. the first. I have not seen the. I have not seen the closer, but I like that. In both cases, we open strong on how other characters feel about this wedding, and then immediately we center on Bella and Edward. We're gonna. We gotta go. We gotta go hard on Bella and Edward. We gotta have a whole lot of wedding toasts that are terrible uniformly awful except charlie's which is great no notes charlie is ever great in this movie uh really hit me when he was giving bella away and you are reminded like in the movies at least that they really love each other yes and you and you're reminded that these are human beings this movie is shot by guillermo novaro who's guillermo del toro's cinematographer it looks beautiful it's and- so pretty Everyone looks different. And it's I think it's because of the way it's shot. They all of a sudden look like real people. <laughs> uh, even the vampires who do look different from everyone else have so much texture to their skin. Uh, the lighting is gorgeous. And I think that I helps this. really humanize all the people, oh, yeah. including Stephanie Meyer, who's watching the wedding. <laughs> now, is she playing Stephanie Meyer? Yes. I had to think about that for a really long time. I do want to note before we get too far from how good everyone looks, I was watching this with friend of the show, Cassandra, who said the the first time Edward was on screen, oh, he doesn't look like he was made of Sculpey this time. Right. (laughs) And it's true. He's he's still sharp. Uh, I would say they all, yeah, they all still look like the vampires actually look. Say that ethereally beautiful this time rather than like freakish somehow because yeah there's something freakish about their beauty but it comes off smoother here i think and yes stephanie meyer attends the wedding of edward and bella because why uh, wouldn't she i i wish they had like had a, i wish they'd had a quick aside where she's like i think there's a book in here and like just sort of <laughs> let that the, uh, everything that is but also little... there's a good sense of humor about this movie there's oh a lot goodness yeah yeah, there's a lot of laughing, uh, a lot of good stuff between Bella and Edward and their honeymoon where they're just having a good time together and enjoying each other's company, which is so nice to see. Especially because the honeymoon in the book is pretty dour for most yes. of it. Like, there's just not a there's not a lot of playfulness to it. I mean, uh, the, what happens in the wedding that's worth noting? Jacob does show up for a bit. We find out he's like seven feet tall now. They don't talk about yeah. this enough. That's so crazy. Nobody is commenting it on any other point. Uh, but Edward does invite him to the <laughs> wedding. Um, he uh, and Bella have a little dance, a little turn in the forest. And then uh, Jacob finds out that they're going to do the deed on the honeymoon and he flies off the handle. He gets so upset about sex. It's wild. And Why would this come up? I mean, I understand why it comes up thematically, but it's so nuts that she's like, they're having this one dance at her wedding to another man. And he's like, so you guys aren't going to have a normal honeymoon, are you? You know what I mean? It would be funny, though, if she found out that vampires don't have genitals, like, <laughs> because we don't know yet. Like, we really don't know. Uh, oh, but we will find out. We get, we do get the honeymoon. We do get the sex scene. It's very chaste, but we do know that he, he, he rips the headboard off. Again, this is all stuff that gets made fun of in, in pop culture, but I think it's handled really well, like. For a teenage It's weird movie? to me that this is made fun of, because I don't think there's anything particularly funny about it. It's like, oh, yeah, he, like, the headboard thing, <laughs> kind of funny. Like, it's cute, though. Yeah. It's not mockable to me. Uh, we get more, like, yes, it is chased, but in the book, we get a literal fade to black. So the fact yeah. that they're, like, touching each other at all still feels a little forbidden. <laughs> yeah. And they have sex more than once in the movie, whereas in the book, it's, like, the once. But... In the book, so in the book, they have sex. The next morning, she's covered in bruises because... 
But it's like, she's like, I don't care. It's I'm a little banged up because I was with a really strong guy who's never had sex before. And Edward's like, I can never touch you again. <laughs> he kind of does the same thing in the movie, but they maintain a playfulness about it. And then she basically climbs on top of him and is like, we're going to do this again. And they do it again. She wears him down in the book eventually, but it is not as fun as this. Like, this is more like, oh, yeah, he would like you can sense that he still wants in on this, but he's just uh, he's about to relent. And he, he literally wants in on this in one shot where she lays down in front of him on the bed with her butt up in the air, wearing nothing but <laughs> underwear. And he stares at her butt for a while and then covers it with a blanket, which is <laughs> I really enjoyed that. Also, just the look. I think they're at a point it like. Uh, Stuart and Pattinson are at a mm. point where their chemistry is so easy. Like, I yeah. love watching them together. I loved the scenes of them, like, them kissing now, even though they were in a relationship most of this time. It just seems like easy as breathing for them at this point. And maybe they yeah. are still in a, like, I think they're still in a relationship at this point, too. I think so, at least. Uh, but it, but it, even if they're not currently in the relationship, you can tell they've been in a relationship. Yeah, yeah. And... I think also like her chemistry with Taylor Lautner has gotten better, mm -hmm. although it does start to feel much more, um, say like familial in this one. There, it it doesn't feel sexually charged to me at all, yeah. and that uh, is good, <laughs> given given the circumstance of what is happening to Jacob emotionally and uh, Bella emotionally because of her uh, her bouncing baby vampire. Uh, you are freezing up like crazy, so it's kind of hard to tell exactly what you're saying all the time. And I think you've frozen up again. I don't know what's happening with the internet. It is nuts, I don't either, and but, I love uh, that. I love that for both of us. Uh, I wonder... There's nothing I can do on my... There's end, nothing like we can do. Right we'll just... We're going to push through it. We're going to push through we it. Much, it. Like, this. much like Bella and Edward. Uh, we get the... <laughs> We get the cleaning lady who suspects he's a vampire for no reason other than that they're in a foreign land. Uh, her specific, um, I think she's Portuguese, and her specific uh, like geographical region has legends of incubi and succubi, and also yeah. like just she just automatically assumes like a vampire is here with a beautiful young girl. Uh, definitely, he's gonna kill her at some point. She is also the one who kind of confirms, like Bella has already confirmed for us. Oh, she's pregnant. Uh, but this woman is like, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come look at you and get a closer look. And yes, that's definitely a a weird hybrid baby in there. Yeah, <laughs> it happens yeah. very strangely in both the book and the movie. And you have a great scene of uh, Edward in fast motion packing a suitcase in the movie. This is one of my favorite things that happens. Uh, we get, we get, so Pella gets pregnant. That's the, that's the gist of the honeymoon is she ends up getting pregnant and the ba baby is half human, half vampire. So of course it advances in age very rapidly and starts creating all kinds of problems. One thing I appreciate about the way Stephanie Meyer writes it, and they kind of portray it in the movie is that when you get pregnant, your body doesn't just have a baby in it. It starts like pushing aside organs and the, the pelvis starts reshaping itself to get ready. This, of course, is happening very quickly in Bella, which causes excruciating pain and the cracking of bones, like, as it goes along. Oh, there is a moment where her spine breaks in the book, and it happens much sooner in the movie. And when yeah. it does, I, I literally, like, went, oh, out loud, because they make the perfect... There's some great Foley work <laughs> in this movie, let me tell yeah. you. Also... Credit to them for making Kristen Stewart look like absolute garbage in this portion of the movie. I don't know if they covered this in the special features. They do. They had to do some kind of CGI on like her neck, mm -hmm. right? Like there's no well, way. You you see her, when you see her revert back to a vampire, they kind of just undo the CGI on screen. Oh yeah. Uh, and then she's the most beautiful ethereal being on earth. Like for a second. But yeah, they... They dump her like she looks she looks bad and you see her topless from the back at one point and they've skinnied her up so much because she can't get any nutrients because she can't can't eat. Yeah. So initially she can't keep down anything at all like they're trying to. So they get her back to the Cullen house and basically transform part of it into like a mini hospital. And yeah. this is well 
well set up from the jump. Congratulations, Stephanie Meyer, that they have the resources to do this and that Carlisle has the expertise. They also have like bags of blood because if you're a doctor, you can buy bags of blood as Seth, uh, <laughs> Seth Clearwater informs us at one point. Uh, so over time, they do realize that the only thing Belle is going to be able to keep down is blood because the baby is thirsty and she kind of likes it. She kind of enjoys yep. it. She gets a little sippy cup. Uh, she's got a straw. Seems great for her. Uh, that doesn't happen uh, for kind of an excruciatingly long time. There's a lot right. of Bella suffering in this book. It, it is funny that it takes them a while to figure out the blood. Th- and it's not actually them. It's Jacob. So Jacob shows up. He gets into a fight with his, with his werewolf boyfriends because they <laughs> want... Bella to be killed because they, they you can't have another vampire. This vampire baby's going to kill her. She got to get rid of the baby. Got to kill the baby. Edward uh, Jacob is like absolutely not, and he leaves the wolf pack, which he's able to do because he act as it has was established in the previous book and movie. He is actually supposed to be the pack leader, but he doesn't want to be a leader. So when he leaves the wolf pack and asserts dominance over the the substitute leader, he becomes in essence a second pack leader, which disconnects him telepathically from the rest of the wolves. And any wolves who join his pack are now telepathically connected with him, which becomes Baby Seth, who's the cutest little boy, oh, and. So uh, and Leah, who is Seth's sister and who hates everybody and hates the world. I am so endeared to Leah in the movie by yeah. the end of this. I don't know that they thread the needle quite as neat. Like, I'm not sure that Stephanie Meyer gets it quite as... not. I'm not going to say seamlessly because it's not supposed to be seamless. But, like, by the end of the movie, I'm sold on her as, like, a pack member and as a character. Mm-hmm. Because she is able to portray the very real pain of watching the person you love be with somebody else and she does it in a way that has pathos and i'm very impressed by it uh i will say watching this with a person who did not read the book it is very unclear the alpha versus alpha fight here. Mm. like it, it is not clear that that is what is happening in the movie whereas i think in the book it's very easy to do because it's just written out rather than and it's written from jacob's yeah. perspective <laughs> Yeah, and rather than them tussling and yelling at each other telepathically and having so much growling involved. But yeah, so this is a huge turn, and uh, and Jacob realizing it is a very well-written internal monologue. Once Jacob takes over perspective in this book, I think it's that's when it really... That's when it sings for me, because I yeah. love how Stephanie Meyer has written this boy. This boy I felt like I knew nothing about until this book now. She dipped her toe into it in the last book. Uh, it begins yes. and ends with Jacob narration, but it's very brief. And I'm wondering if she did that knowing she was going to have to do it in this book, because mm-hmm. like this book, you can't narrate it from Bella's perspective because A, she doesn't do much during this part of the book, and B... Uh, it would actually give, I think, give too much away too early on because Bella's kind of in her own head the whole time. Uh, Jacob's also living with the Cullens by this point, which is adorable. And he has a thing with Rosalie in the book where he's constantly trying to get her goat by telling her dumb blonde jokes. And there's a moment in the book that's only in the extended cut of the movie where he asks for food and she brings him food in a dog dish. Really funny. Uh, and it's in the movie. It's very funny in the movie. Uh, and then he eats the hot dog that she brings him. And then he chucks the dog dish at her head, <laughs> hits her in the back of the head, which, of course, she barely responds to until she finds out that hot dog got in her hair. And it's a great moment for Rosalie. It's very funny. It's very funny for the Collins because they all laugh at it. It's a it's a good like tension breaker for an otherwise very, very dark movie. Uh but yeah, I think Condon just understands comedy well, and so he allows that to come through a lot more. Yeah, we also get, like, you say that Jacob living with them is adorable. Part of why it's adorable is Alice can't hear or see anything mm. uh, when the baby is around. The baby is too powerful, and this will come into play much more when the baby is a girl. Uh, but currently in the womb is still too powerful thought wise to let Alice in anywhere. And the only thing that soothes Alice is if she is with Jacob. So the two of them will just chill. They just hang out. And you get to the, like he gets to the point where he's like, 
Maybe these people aren't so bad. Esma's making me sandwiches. Carlisle uh, just feels weird to disrespect. Edward and I have this weird buddy-buddy thing going on that I'm resisting, but he is fully embracing. <laughs> like, it's very, it's very good. <laughs> he froze. Uh, I, I missed about a half of what you said, so I'm going to assume it was all... Uh, delightful and cheerful about yeah it was about, it was uh, about how great uh how great everything is don't worry about it <laughs> uh, because there's a great scene between alice and jacob on the balcony uh where she reveals that being next to jacob is like being able to finally close her eyes yes uh, yes and i i assume there's a lot of fanfic written about the two of them because i Reading the book, I actually felt like their relationship was drawn better than her relationship with Jasper. I... Her relationship with Jasper isn't drawn at all. Um, yeah. If you hear me, I I'm looking for it right now. Don't worry. I'll find it. <laughs> I'm looking at Archive of Her Own, obviously. Yeah. Any, really any... Yeah, we got to find it. We got to find it. Alice Jacob slash fic. Yeah, it's, oh, I'm... It, it's just her sitting next to him being able to read a book for the first time in her life because... It's really nice and it's very sweet. And Alice is this character that I kind of go back and forth on because, uh, like, we've talked about it, the manipulation. Yeah. Uh, but... I like this. I, I like I like the way she behaves in this one. This is harder to find than you would think. I was gonna say, not a website set up for like easy, easy surfing. There are nine total fix with this. Only nine. Only nine. Was this like the website that people were using back when the book came out? No, or? you know what? That's a really good point. They were probably yeah. still over on fanfiction. Fanfic, yeah. Um, I'll be That's doing some thinking. research this afternoon. Do some research. If you find any good stuff, let me know. Uh, <laughs> so ultimately, we discover that Edward has a telepathic link with the baby. Uh, once that happens, things start chilling out a little bit because the baby is able to like relax a little, knowing. Yeah, he doesn't. Uh, Edward doesn't hate the baby anymore. Up until this yeah. point, he's been very self-flagellating about the baby. Very like, this is all my fault. He's the baby is going to kill Bella, but. Uh, the first thing Edward communicates with the baby is that the baby loves Bella. Yeah. The baby loves Bella. And that baby... makes it all okay. And ba <laughs> Jacob's kind of resentful of that because he thought that Edward had been on his side this whole time. And Jacob starts to like feel this compulsion that he's going to have to be the one to fix the situation. Yeah. And the other thing is that the problem is going to be that the baby, historically, mythologically, whenever anything like this has happened, the baby has always torn itself out of the mother. That's like one thing they're worried about. Yeah. So it's going to have to be a C-section. The problem is you can't, the, the, like the embryonic sac that the baby is in is vampire material, which means <laughs> you can't cut through it. The only thing that can cut through it is... Go. You may as well just go ahead and do the chant right now. Teeth, 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 teeth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was always going to end like this, right? We were always going to have to have a vampire C-section of these books. It was only a matter of time. Uh, this scene in the movie is almost more sexually charged than their honeymoon. <laughs> but we'll get there. <laughs> it's... We almost get a Cronenberg scene when it comes it's to a... the. Oh, the book. The book is like gross and I love it. I was yeah. so happy during that. I was hooting and hollering over that scene because, oh, uh, like before we get to the actual birth scene, we get this whole section where Jacob goes to the like, I guess what sounds like the. What sounds like the uh, the Forks Washington equivalent of like like Venice Boulevard or something like or Venice Beach like yeah. like he's just going and cruising. Uh, he's he's checking out girls. He's like, I got to imprint on one of these chicks, and it doesn't. He's work. trying to imprint with every girl. He's like, 
<laughs> this one. And even then, he does <laughs> say, one. "I guess it was stupid for me to think like my soulmate would would just be here." And it turns out she's not. Actually, no. she's been in Bella's womb this entire time. Uh, so he, when he gets back uh, shortly after his sojourn, is when we get uh, Bella going into labor. Um, it's yeah, it's disgusting in the book. It's very visceral. It's really well written. It makes me think that Stephanie Meyer probably should pivot to actual horror at some point because it is so good. Anyway, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. So the movie, the movie, you don't see a whole lot, but. Keep in mind that they have Kristen Stewart's body looking so veiny and desiccated and gray. And then you see them, they, they cut her open and then Edward kind of has to dip down below the belly and be like, oh, and he bad. comes up with like blood. But it's still just like, oh my God, that's like something out of Dead Ringers. Like this, <laughs> like this, this, this like horrific moment. They pull out the baby and then Bella freaking dies. She dies. She dies. And we have like a Pulp Fiction size needle of Edward's venom that he shoots into her chest. This doesn't work. So he gives her little bites all over her body. She's going to have mm-hmm. these. And it's this is the part which is kind of sexy. Like he's just gnawing all over her at this point. And Jacob is watching, standing by in horror as this is occurring. Sometimes we get to have a little break just to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is going to be our shortest episode ever. I think probably, yes. Uh, don't tell anyone that there were technical difficulties. They won't be able to tell. <laughs> they will absolutely be able to tell. What with you <laughs> freezing every like five minutes and like your, but, but because you're sending me your recording, your sound will just continue over this beautiful freeze frame of you like grimacing or making some kind of hilarious face. <laughs> because it always. Really good faces, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> it always freezes with you like. <laughs> I mean, honestly, your side too, because you freeze yep. at about the same moment. It's very, very good. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, baby, baby. Oh my god! I just hit the. There's this. <laughs> there's this thing on this desk, so uh, the cat won't attack this one specific Lego set that she keeps eating, and I just set it off. It's a. It sends out a puff of air, so the cat knows not to go there, and you don't have to like spray it with water. <laughs> Anyway, nice. I just set it off on myself, and it is very startling. That's effective. Anyway. Um, now, of course, you did not freeze at all during that anecdote. No, clearly not. Why would I do that? It's very You're... important that I talk about the scat. That's what it's called. Oh, no, this is a... You know what? Let's just keep going. I was going to say, you're burdened, you're burdened through useful non-freezing this time. This is useful. Uh, yeah. Oh, and you froze again. See, oh, this my... is what we deal with. Okay. Okay. We'll pull ourselves together. Um, (laughs) You wasted it. Anyway, uh, yeah, so uh, Jacob sees that Bella is dead and he is sobbing, he is crying, he is furious at Baby, who has been removed at this point. Uh, After the baby uh, comes out, Rosalie takes the baby and goes downstairs with it uh, in the Cullen house and is having a nice little sit with Baby. Oh, I also missed the part where the baby uh, does a chomp on Bella's breast uh, and gets some gets some more blood out of her. Right, which is right, crazy. Uh, uh, long story short, Jacob comes up behind Rosalie. He sees the baby's face. He immediately imprints on it. The baby is named Renee's Rene uh, oh, oh, let's talk about that for one second. In the book, they're all like, oh, that name is beautiful. In the movie, they me. actually do make a joke of the name, yeah. which I appreciated because the name is ludicrous. <laughs> yeah. It also makes uh, in the me movie, so mad. In the movie, yeah. they're like... Go on. Uh, I wanted to mention that I worked with a woman who got pregnant very young. And when she was pregnant, she was like... And she was probably like 18. Mm-hmm. And she was like, we've decided we're going to name the baby Raven because that's going to be cool. And... That that spirit is captured so well in the movie of her being like, I think Renee's May. 
And they're like, great, sure, that works. That's a nice tribute, Bella. Uh, the, the, it's, just, it's played off very well. Uh, spoiler alert, the middle name of the baby is Carly, which is a combination of Carlisle and Charlie, and is in fact a normal name that maybe they just should have gone with for the first name. I remember being infuriated about this when I first read the book. <laughs> like the Renesme thing. <laughs> they should I, have like... named it Charlisle. <laughs> Better, <laughs> cleaner than Renesme. Still. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah. So the uh, baby's name is Renesme. Uh, and, there's uh, a lot of yeah. Then th- some of the worst vampire at the end. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> some of the worst CG uh, in in the movie is the the baby's face is really awful to look at. Uh, I don't better care than the baby it. puppet. Better than the puppet they had built originally. They built that fake baby. Uh, they built. They were gonna try to use a little animatronic baby. Nope. No good. Remember the baby uh, that went around like it was an American and sniper. You're gone. I can't. I don't. I don't know what you're doing. I don't know where you went. <laughs> uh, uh, I was talking about the baby and American sniper. Um. Oh. <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, Bella turns into a vampire. There is like a nice long sequence in yep. in the movie of or, or, of her kind of reanimating. Basically, yeah. like she grow like she grows back into a normal looking person and then becomes very beautiful. Like she has a full face and makeup without uh, without even trying. Opens her eyes and they're red. Um, we also get a moment in the movie where Sam and his pack come to kill the baby. And Edward is like, you yeah. can't do that. The treaty clarifies that once someone is imprinted, no harm can be done. And uh-oh, guess what Jacob did? Heck yeah. Uh, also, in the director's cut, there's a moment where uh, Edward throws Jacob against a wall and breaks his arm to keep him from having to fight his own pack. That really doesn't come to anything because werewolves can instantly heal themselves. But uh, it, it, it's an exciting little scene, I guess. The werewolf stuff isn't in the book. And it, I mean, that that the werewolf fight's not in the book. And that I can see where they put that in because it kind of builds the ending to some kind of climax as opposed to just Bella being reborn. Uh, we kind of get this so exciting character moment. Uh, because that's literally the end of the movie. Her eyes open, roll credit. Oh, yeah. her eyes open. Yeah. Her eyes open, Her eyes open roll credits, credits, and then there's the post credit scene with the Volturi. Yes. So I understand structurally why the werewolf fight is there, but I don't like it because I think it's long and boring. But that's yeah. just me when there's a fight involving the vampires and the werewolves because it's just like, there's these big guys and they're fighting these fast guys. Also, a lot of watching wolves get punched in the face. Not the best, not my favorite. <laughs> Uh, I wish we weren't freezing so much because this is the point where we would discuss the fact that the first three books and the first half of this book have all been about Bella's body not being under her own control, about men trying to control what she does, where she goes, who she is, what she becomes. And the first half of this book ends with the resolution of that entire arc, which is with her taking herself into like getting what she wants and and fully becoming into herself as a vampire the second half will be kind of like what comes of that and how like the fallout from all that uh Mm -hmm. but it is it is as far as a character goes a great pretty cool if you read it all together just what from where she starts to where she ends up and how she has to kind of passively assert herself at times yeah yeah it's uh the second it's okay. This for me this movie has strong half movie syndrome. Like I it, uh and that I don't think that's the case with the book and honest obviously like it's the book isn't natural it's naturally divided into three parts, but it's not like this is the end and now we are going to have a different story and it, it is a story that can stand right. on its own. I do think the story does a decent job standing on its own because we have the beginning of the wedding, the middle of the uh, like the pregnancy and the end of vampire, which is decent. But I still don't know if enough happens in this uh, 
to justify having two movies. That's just me, though. If I had seen it in the theater, I think I would have been frustrated because it is it's like a, it's like a bottle episode almost like yeah. it almost it takes place in two locations, essentially their house and the honeymoon suite. Mm-hmm. And uh, which is fine because I know they go global in the next movie. I know that like things get bigger. Oh, uh, oh, you're in for a real treat. <laughs> I also know uh, that. We- Lee yeah. Pace shows up, which is going to be tough for me. Yes, uh, we get a taste of the other vampires we're going to meet at the wedding. Um, Shannon from Lost is there, and yeah. she's not happy. But the rest of them are all just kind of nice people wearing pretty dresses and handsome suits. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, uh, it is interesting that this uh, the story is largely about bodily autonomy. <laughs> and I don't know if Stephanie Meyer knew she was writing about that. Yeah, <laughs> uh, this is the first film that Stephanie Meyer was like a full. This is the first film that Stephanie Meyer was like a full producer on. Uh, she had even more creative control over it than she had previously, even though she had a lot of control over over the other movies. Everyone seems to love working with her. Like it just it comes across in all the interviews that they're like, no, she's great. She's good to have on set. It's fun to bounce ideas off of her. She's open to anything. <laughs> Mm -hmm. it's nice to hear that filming these things i mean it's not like okay so like in special features you're not going to be able to necessarily pick up on friction among Mm -hmm. the cast but given how many of these people are like still friendly given how many of them have worked together again like i have to think this was a good working environment i mean you can usually tell what they've cut around in epks uh, like you can tell when like, huh, no one's talking about this person. Oh, okay. But there's, I mean, they talk to people and yeah, they're all putting on their best faces, but it doesn't seem like it doesn't, I don't know. It just does. It seems far more legit than even the interviews did in the, in the first movie. Like, it just seems like they are, they've all, they're all so comfortable with each other now. Uh, now this movie was filmed simultaneously with part two. Like, not even back to back, but like at the same time, they were filming stuff for part two while they were filming this. So it was this huge, like huge continuity thing. All the actors are like, we had to take intricate notes because we never knew like which movie we were filming at any given day. We'd be filming that stuff from like the last movie. It would be movie. so disorienting, and, especially given mm-hmm. the tonal shift that we're about to hit. Yeah. So they, they said that one thing Condon was really good at was making sure they were. They knew where they were, what they were doing, what their relationship was at that moment and working with the actors on that kind of stuff because it was a huge project. This was a big project. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's so interesting to me. I I also wonder what the need was for that. No, I mean, I don't wonder what the need was for that. They wanted to get these out as soon as possible. They wanted to get them out on schedule, which for the Twilight movies is like, mm, what, like two weeks between releases? (laughs) Right. (laughs) It's just crazy because, like, you think about something like, okay, like, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, I think, was just filmed all the way through at once. It just took an exceptionally long time. I assume it was similar with Mockingjay. Because, again, like, I don't watch the special features of all of these the way you do. I've watched more Twilight stuff than I normally do. I've also watched a lot of uh, dumb, like, Twilight meme videos throughout this time. Because this has reminded me of a really great age of the internet. When things felt sort of untainted. And you could just, uh, you could make a bad lip reading video of something. And it could get 10 million views. Yeah. And have the dumbest jokes you've ever heard. And you'll laugh the entire time. What's weird is I have several friends now who are rereading these books for reasons I don't know why. Like they just seem to have started. Friends of the pod. They are listening. They're, they're not. They're not friends of the pod. These are just randos. Should uh, make them become friends of the pod. They need their listening companion. <laughs> but it's funny because I'm like, oh, they're doing it for the wrong reasons. Like they're all like. <laughs> I'm like, oh, come on. Like, they're all like, well, here we go. And they're like, oh, this is painful. And I'm like, you just don't, you just don't get Twilight like I do. You just, you you just don't have the perspective I have on the actual genius that this series is. It's only a painful if you're, if you're approaching it from that point of view, because like, 
I was so jazzed to reread these, even though I knew that I was going to get very frustrated occasionally. Uh-huh. So, like, the first book, I was like, this whips, this uh, this owns, this honks. This is all I want to read for the next little while. I was genuinely frustrated that I couldn't keep reading this book. Like, stopping mm-hmm. at the end of chapter 18, like, oh, borderline physically pained me. And I was like, well, I guess I'll go read Stephen King's Night Shift. Uh, <laughs> just... Which, by the way, is a treat in a dream. I love Night yes. Shift. I'm rereading it right now. It makes me very happy. But I just want to be ensconced in the warm blanket of Breaking Dawn, uh, now part two. And I'm excited to watch the second movie because yeah. we don't have to, th- like, it's not as heavy. It's way more action dense. And it does feel like they're building up to. I, like, I think this the book feels like it is divided into these parts of, like, we have to think about what's happening. We have to think about the gravity of the situation before we can revisit our old friends, Michael Sheen and the other guys. Uh, one of them is um, the guy who eventually played Vecna in Stranger Things. Did you know that? Pretty cool. Oh, I did not know that because I have not watched Stranger Things season four yet. Why would you? Sorry. Because I'm watching them at this, with my 12 year old right now, and we haven't gotten, we just finished season three. So, mostly excited for you to eventually get to the CJ the X video about uh, the end of the season. But, um, uh, but, uh, but to wrap up, because I do have a hard out today. You sure do. I'm uh, usually the one who has a hard out, and it's usually for therapy, but yours is for your actual job. <laughs> mine's for my actual job. Uh, Breaking Dawn Part 1 is the last movie that got any substantial like making of stuff because I don't know why. There's there's not even a Breaking Dawn Part 2 behind the scenes book. Like it even <laughs> says Part 1. Uh but then they there's no like uh, there's no like real featurettes for Part 2. There's no extended cut for Part 2. It kind of came out and they were like we're done, we're good, we're good and then they just they moved on. Like they were like, you're either going to see this one or you're not. We don't need to push it that hard. Um, but I'm really, I'm just, I'm just enjoying the heck out of myself. And we've got so many more episodes to do. Maybe we should record them in the evening at some point because the traffic will be a little lower. <laughs> I mean, we can do that. Uh, it'll feel a little closer to like, it feels moodier. Feels right in that way. Um, although we're kind of, we're through with the moody stuff. I think they really get that out of the way at the beginning of the movie series. They, like, front load that. And yes, there is plenty about uh, this movie that is dark, uh, but it's handled with such a deft tone. And the funny stuff is really funny. I don't remember how much that carries through to the next one. I know that there's a lot of actors where you're like, oh, they did things later in this. We got some Rami Malek coming up. Oh, we got a lot coming up. I'm very excited for you to meet all of these cross cultural vampires. (laughs) Maybe there will be some things that are offensive. We can't know right now. Well, Uh, (laughs) we did watch the uh, we watched the Vampire Council episode of What We Do in the Shadows, uh, (laughs) which has gotten me all excited for the 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 (laughs) worldwide vampires in this movie. Really good episode too. Uh, It is. Evan Rachel Wood is a vampire, I think. <laughs> For some she reason. She is. Yeah. <laughs> Love She's her. Evan. She's about to play Audrey in a uh, little shop. Oh right. Wow. Um I try I'm trying to pull up the the Mad Magazine parody of Breaking Dawn. It is not Breaking Wind, as you were hoping. Uh but I'm gonna have to do that for the next one, or else what I'm gonna is freeze it called? my computer. I can't remember. I'm gonna have to do it next time because it's going to freeze my computer if I try That's to bring true. just the fact that they called it literally anything but that when it's oh the overarching thing is the to- the toilet saga is the very toilets. upsetting to me I'm gonna write a letter to the editor right now <laughs> well before you go do that Christy what are we saying goodbye to in this oh, episode uh, say goodbye to it can't be vampire c-section can it that's not clean enough um Huh. This one's hard. How about can we say goodbye to uh to a Charlisle? <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say headboard, but uh Charlisle's good too. <laughs> say goodbye to you say goodbye to your antique Charlisle headboard, everyone. <laughs> goodbye, antique Charlisle headboard. <laughs> goodbye. <laughs>